Um, I'm so delighted to have you here to share a little bit about your background and experience in investment management, your faith background. Why don't you just start with a story about kind of where some of those faith values got formed early part of your life? Sure. So, um, hi everyone. I'm Tom Marthaler. I uh, got involved with uh, impact investing uh, through Felipe and others. Uh, I work with uh, Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration. I'm on their impact investing committee. Uh, I got involved with uh, Impact about a year and a half ago, uh, but I spent uh, my whole career in uh, uh, investment management. I worked uh, for almost 40 years uh, in investment management. I held a number of roles, but spent most of my time uh, managing money for other people, both individuals and for institutions. Uh, in the world of investing uh, that I grew up in and spent most of my career in, uh, there was a, a really a strong focus on return. Uh, obviously, success was measured in many cases by performance. Uh, how did you do versus uh, your benchmark versus your peers? Uh, and if you didn't perform well, uh, what happened? Well, what mistakes were made? Uh, it was really about just uh, maximizing return uh, and also uh, a little bit about risk. Uh, certainly that was another factor as well. But I think as I uh, continued in my career, I recognized that I um, also was interested in uh, impact. Uh, I don't know if I really understood it the way I do now, uh, but uh, you know, I recognize that there were opportunities that uh, provided more benefit th than others. Uh, and I think my uh, faith background growing up Catholic in uh, practicing my faith has uh, had an implied impact on uh, how I made decisions and you know, how I've evolved as a decision maker. Participating in the Livable Futures workshop really I think helped to crystallize a lot of my thoughts and really helped me formalize a little bit more of my thinking. And also being part of the Impact Investment uh, Committee for the Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration has, has continued my education. And uh, I really, you know, when I think about what's the difference, uh, you know, there's a way of investing that most people say, uh, if, you're, if you're going to make a decision, the first question somebody asks you is, you know, what are your return requirements? Uh, and then after uh, you answer that question, they say, well, how much risk are you willing to take? Uh, and once you reconcile those two, typically then you've got an answer, right? Uh, well, high return means you're probably gonna have to pursue more risk uh, to achieve those objectives. But when, you, when you're looking at impact investing, you really have to ask a third question, which is, you know, how much impact do you wanna make? And, uh, you know, then the question becomes, if you have three things you're, you're answering, return, risk, and impact, how do you rank them? And you know, which one is more important, which is at the top, which is at the bottom? Maybe they're all equally weighted. Depends on the investor. But uh, having that conversation, I think, really is important. Uh, and, and the greater impact that you want to put on um, the impact side of uh, the decision, obviously, you're going to have to think about you know, what does that mean for return? What does that mean for risk? So um, that's a little bit about you know how I've evolved and you know as as we've worked on different opportunities you know we we kind of think about them in, in those uh, three categories at this point. That's so helpful, Tom. That third dimension, the third question, the question about how do you weight them and how do you consider them. Give us a little more of the contours of your investment management career and some of the steps along the way and just where you ended up uh, before you retired and um, and I want to jump in especially on kind of bonds and fixed income today. Sure. So I, so I spent uh, most of my career uh, in the fixed income market uh, doing research, uh, also doing some trading and then uh, managing portfolios of fixed income. So I've had experience in all areas. Uh, I've also, uh, because of when I started in the business, I was able to work as a generalist, which meant that I worked across all fixed income asset classes. Uh, the business today is much more specialized uh, and people are very focused on a particular segment of the market. Uh, at most asset management firms, but my background, <clears throat> excuse me, is more of a, a generalist. And um, in, in terms of how, how does that apply to impact investing, I think, you know, I, I recognize uh, and understand, you know, why people raise money in fixed income and, and the, what their objectives are. And uh, first thing you have to understand is that, you know, what, what's the intention uh, when they're borrowing money, you know, one example would be in the corporate marketplace, a lot of the deals that come to market uh, come with what's known as general corporate purposes. So that's a really vague term to say that if a company borrows money, they're gonna use it uh, in a way that they think benefits the organization. Uh, so as a lender, you really don't have much control over where your money uh, is invested. So 
Um, that's very common in the corporate marketplace. Uh, you know, the other alternative that's much more attractive is something called use of proceeds. And what that means is that if you borrow money, you're dedicating that uh, funding to a very specific project. So it might be community development, uh, it could be an environmental project, but it's clear that the lender understands that the money that they're uh, lending to a, a borrower is going directly to a project that is of uh, interest. So certainly that's something I think that you need to be very focused on in the fixed income market. One of the first questions to ask is, uh, you know, what, what type of deal is it? If it's for general corporate purposes, then you really don't have much influence over uh, how that money is spent. Uh, you need to know that up front. You need to determine if that's appropriate. Uh, it may be appropriate if you feel comfortable with the way the business is run and, and the objectives that they have. Uh, but um, you're, de you're certainly delegating the uh, ability to uh, spend that money uh, in the way that they feel is of interest to them and not maybe necessarily in line with impact goals. You talk a little about corporate. What other segments of the bond markets are there? And give us some relative perspective on each. So, um, you know, I, I think it's interesting if you look at the bond market, you, you could argue that a significant part of the bond market has already uh, thought about impact investing uh, going back to when um, housing market bonds first came, uh, uh, which is really late 70s, I think, probably. Uh, you know, the names that I'm thinking about would be Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac uh, in particular. Uh, those are government uh, sponsored entities, uh, as you probably know, they purchase single family home mortgages primarily from individuals uh, through the banks that lend the money. So a bank gives you a loan uh, and then the bank might not uh, keep the loan on their balance sheet. They may sell it to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. So they pull these together and create mortgage securities. Uh, there is a way to purchase Fannie and Freddie mortgages uh, that are very segmented and focused on a particular community and or uh, group of individuals. So you can get a desired impact in those uh, markets uh, by focusing on maybe a region uh, or a certain uh, type of uh, group of individuals you want to support for housing. That's super helpful. Um, and those have evolved quite a bit and been a huge part of the bond market, as I understand. There's also, can you give us a little bit of federal kind of treasuries and also municipal bonds and other kind of segments of the market there? Yeah. So if you think, if you think about the market, there's um, different ways to, to measure it, but the investment grade market uh, is primarily government related securities. Investment grade would be the higher quality bonds. Uh, so things like corporate bonds, uh, mortgage securities, uh, government bonds fall into that category. Um, within those uh, government bonds, treasuries and mortgages represent uh, the majority of, of the market as measured by bond indexes. An example would be the Bloomberg Barclays uh, bond index. Uh, if you look at that index as a measure of investment grade bonds, most of it falls into what I would say is potential categories of imp impact, particularly on the mortgage side. Uh, the corporate side, as I mentioned, uh, smaller part of the index uh, and in the corporate side, you really have to understand what are the funds being used for? Is it general corporate purposes or use of proceeds? The good thing about mortgage-related bonds, you know specifically where the funding is coming from, and you know, uh, you know, you can determine then whether that's uh, consistent with what your objectives are. The other, the other part of the fixed income market that is uh, popular would be uh, uh, below investment grade, non-investment grade bonds. Sometimes they're called junk bonds. Uh, very similar to corporate bonds. Um, in the sense that they, you know, have the same kind of uh, lending uh, requirements, the uh, the big difference is your your risk of repayment goes up. So if you're buying a high yield bond, uh, you're typically borrowing, or excuse me, you're lending money to a borrower who has uh, maybe less of a established cr credit uh, history. Uh, they may um, be a newer business. They may be in a very competitive environment. So you're taking more risk. So you expect to get a higher uh, level of interest on those bonds. Uh, another category is emerging market bonds. I think that that's an interesting category for uh, impact investing. And uh, emerging market bonds historically were uh, more focused on what's called the sovereign level, which would be kind of government related bonds. So you could buy bonds issued by the Republic of Colombia or Mexico or you know countries in Asia, countries in Europe. Um, 
But now there's more opportunities to invest locally uh, in corporations and in projects. I think there's a tremendous amount of uh, potential there or impact investing uh, in, uh, in, in non-US markets uh, as we go forward. Um, those would be all probably more in what I would call the category of private investments. Up until now, pretty much what we've been talking about is public fixed income. Public fixed income, like public equities, uh, frequently traded, uh, available uh, to transact at any time, get in and get out. Uh, private uh, fixed income, uh, like private equity, uh, requires a little bit of a give up in liquidity in exchange for um, you know, getting involved in a project that you want to support uh, and committing to a longer time period. That is super helpful, Tom, just giving us the general architecture here of the markets and different segments. Um, you were talking a little about impact and you were kind of indicating towards um, emerging market bonds in the public, let's say in the public a little bit more. How would one go about thinking about impact there and um, whatever different kind of trends have you seen kind of in ESG over the past you know, couple of decades or just your own approach to thinking about where is more impactful given your own kind of sense of this? So, so I would say most organizations um, have been uh, doing ESG related research um, for many years, uh, even though they might not have always called it that. An example would be is on a, a corporate credit analysis, uh, you would always be considering uh, obvious, obviously the ability of the company to repay its debt, but you know, you're looking at the credibility of management, uh, you're looking at you know, what their corporate objectives are. Uh, so you're making a sub, uh, subjective assessment of of the company beyond what's on their balance sheet and, and income statement. Uh, today with ESG, uh, it's gone into much more of a formalized process, you know, where you're getting into very specific criteria. Uh, I would say there's really a couple of different ways that asset management firms address ESG. One is that uh, they outsource that, they use uh, third party uh, rating services to help them understand uh, what the ESG measurement of a company should be by the services they subscribe to. Um, and then they use that to integrate that into their research process. Uh, the other approach I think is becoming increasingly more popular is uh, having an ESG uh, team within an investment team integrated within the research process uh, where it really becomes part of the uh, internal due diligence approach uh, I think that's where the uh, market is headed. I think that's where most asset management firms are going um, and they're moving in that direction, I think more rapidly, particularly in the last year or two than maybe they were uh, four or five years ago. Yeah, flesh out a little bit of the implications of that. So when you have the kind of ESG or the kind of corporate credibility as you're thinking about management, you're also thinking about what, what else are you thinking about in terms of environment and social priorities, goals of the company and how, how does that how does that show up or how, how does that change when the team is sitting alongside as integrated part of the diligence process? Well, I think, I think you know, the way, the way I would describe it as somebody who came from the asset management industry, you know, our, our goals are always uh, to meet our clients' objectives. Uh, what we need to do is understand what are our clients looking for. And I think if you went back maybe five years ago or longer, uh, there was some uh, interest in socially responsive investing. Um, and that was really more about excluding, uh, we'll call it investments that didn't meet clients objectives. Uh, ESG is obviously takes it to another level where you're trying to uh, engage more with the companies and understand how they operate and then challenge them on some of those requirements. A lot of that has been driven, to be honest with you, by clients who are interested in those uh, priorities. Uh, investors probably uh, in not in all cases, but in many cases, we're still risk and return driven. Uh, but as our clients demanded more of an emphasis on impact, uh, as measured at least initially by ESG, uh, they began to, became aware of that and began to understand how they needed to integrate that into their process. Uh, as I mentioned, it's always been there, uh, I would say more informally, but now if you were to talk to a credit analyst and they were to give you a recommendation on a company, uh, you know, they would talk about the cash flow, the profitability, uh, other financial metrics, and then they would get into much more specific details uh, about ESG criteria and how that influenced their decision, uh, ultimately the recommendation that they're making. So it's really become much more integrated in uh, part of the process. And, uh, you know, I think that's a good thing for investors overall. Um, 
it's really helpful to talk with you, Tom, because you're you're on the investor side now. Prior, you had been on the kind of advisor investment management t- side. Um, a lot of the uh, listeners of, of this recording will be will be kind of from the investor side and curious about how they can push advisors. And you said a lot of this has been driven by clients. Where, where do you see some of the trends in terms of today, investment managers evolving, responding? Um, what, what can investors that want more impact, that want kind of a little more prioritization of these questions, um, what can they do with their advisor? What kinds of questions help move those conversations forward well, especially in this fixed income space? Yeah, I, I think that, the, you know, the questions are really uh, having uh, an understanding of what your manager offers, you know, what what are they doing right now? How are they addressing impact investing? You know, is it integrated into their process uh, and seamless, or is it something that's relatively new to them? Um, you know, many investment managers will tell you we can do this, uh, and I think that's probably true. But the question is, how far are they along in the process? Uh, how much thought are they given to it? Um, are they really taking it seriously and uh, making it um, a priority? Uh, but I think you know we we have to remember that as uh, clients, you know, we we have the right to uh, ask our managers uh, these questions, and we have to. Uh, expect them to give us the answers we want to hear. Uh, if we don't feel that our manager is answering those questions, there are many other managers out there that are uh, able to help with this. So challenging your manager, I think, is uh, you know is a good thing. And having been on the other side where my clients challenge me, I always appreciate that because you want to make sure, as I mentioned before, that you're meeting your client's objectives. And sometimes if you're not communicating and staying in contact on trends in the market, you might be making assumptions that are incorrect about what your clients are looking for. So it's really a two-way conversation, uh, but managers should uh, should be able to address those questions today um, pretty quickly. If they don't, then uh, I think it's a pr- probably a good answer that uh, that they haven't considered it, but that's, I think, a small minority. I think most firms are considering and acting upon it. Some are obviously further along than others. That was so helpful, Tom. I think that what you just said there is the encouragement to challenge our managers and also to ask them how far along and how much thoughtfulness. And I think that's yeah. usually pretty apparent as you proceed. So just encouraging um, each of you to follow your instincts as you think about these things. Let's move a little bit to the private um, fixed income side of things. And what are the trends emerging there? Where are the deepest opportunities for impact? Um, in particular, I hear a lot about social impact bonds coming from the social enterprise community. I hear a lot about green bonds and those also kind of from both government and in, you know others. Um, curious a little bit of what you see and what you're hearing. Yeah, I think, you know, to your point, I think there's a lot of opportunities out there. Um, what I would say though, is each in each case, you know, we need to understand um, more details about what's actually happening. You know, green bonds is an example of a category that you know, on the surface, sounds appealing, right? Especially if you're trying to address uh, environmental concerns. Uh, but you need to understand how the project is financed. You know, what are the objectives um, that are being uh, used? Uh, you know, who's benefiting uh, and who's impacted if there are uh, issues? Uh, so uh, it's not as simple as just saying, you know, I like green bonds, bonds or I like sustainable sustainability linked bonds or another particular category, especially when you get on the private side, you really have to understand, you know, what's going on uh, in our, um, you know, are you comfortable with how things are being handled? You know, I think an interesting example would be is uh, if, you know, if you're return focused, one of the first questions you're going to ask uh, in a private deal is, you know, what's, what's the yield, you know, what's the cash flow, how much am I going to earn? If you're impact focused, you probably want to start with understanding, you know, who benefits, you know, how, how is this financing going to help the underlying borrowers? And, you know, are we really putting them in a better place uh, when they get these funds? Or are we just maybe um, holding them hostage if they're unable to pay off their debt at some point in the future? And that kind of gets into the next question that comes up that's um, important. And that would be uh, extractive versus non-extractive finance. Uh, really what that means uh, is for, investors, you know, a a bond investment is a contract between a borrower and a lender where there's an agreement on terms, uh, and then that contract is followed. Um, So an example would be is what happens if the borrower is unable to make payments? Uh, In an extractive type uh, agreement, you would enforce the terms and you would say that you don't have a choice. This is what we agreed to. You need to pay or we're going to foreclose. A non-abstractive contract, which obviously is much more in line with impact investing, would be, let's have a conversation. 
let's understand why you're unable to pay. Is it a temporary problem? Uh, you know, can we give you a grace period? Uh, you try to work things out uh, and you're doing that ultimately because the agreement that you got involved in to begin with was something that was put in place primarily uh, to add value, right? And not to take out more value than we're contributing. And I think that's a really important point to make is in uh, impact investing uh, on the private side in particular, where you have much more control over the terms and, and the details is making sure that you know you, you put in place an agreement that's flexible uh, so that you can work with your clients to ultimately achieve that goal of uh, adding more value than you take out. Um, you hit on something so beautiful there, just about how we embody our values of human dignity and really recognize the dignity of each person here and recognizing that things don't always go as expected, right? And when the unforeseen mm -hmm. does occur, how do you treat each other? And I think um, the opportunity we have as we kind of enter into these uh, arrangements is to kind of not just take the off the shelf terms, but consider what terms might be non extracted in this way that really are adding more value or taking from the beneficiary community we're trying to support with this investment. Um, so that was really practical advice on things we can do. Um, any other pieces we think about moving from this extractive kind of traditional practices, maybe in some cases, and then non extractive, and it requires a flexibility, right? If unforeseen happens. What other kind of things do you point us to? Is there a, more of a lineage we can draw on, on this? Is there certain templates we can draw on or certain practices? I mean, curious more to flesh that out further. Yeah, I, I'm not sure, to be honest with you. I, I, I think, you know, the way I think about it is, is, is just really having that flexibility and, you know, making that uh, known up front. I think, you know, all investors um, want to know what the expectations are. Uh, and, uh as long as that's clear, uh, you know, what the process is and how you're going to work through challenges as, as they come along, um, then I think you're, you're, in a, you're in the right spot. Um, I think where the problems come in is, is you know, you lend money through something like, let's say, microfinance uh, to people that uh, need the money, but then unfortunately are unable to pay the loans. And then if you're foreclosing on those, uh, you're really creating uh, a worse off uh, situation than it was before you tried to get involved. So, it gets back to the question, why did you make that loan to begin with? Um, if it was return-based, then the outcome is consistent with a return-based lending. But if you're, if you're really impact-driven, uh, you should be going into that with the expectation that you, know, you're, you need to have flexibility uh, to work through uh, unexpected circumstances as they come along. Tom, you've mentioned to me CCM. Uh, I wonder if you could just share a little bit about your understanding of them and your approach and some of your appreciation of what they're up to. Yeah, sure. So CCM, Community Capital Management, is a uh, primarily, uh, at least from our experience, they're a public fixed income investor. Uh, they have funds uh, and separately managed accounts uh, that meet impact investing objectives. Uh, what they offer is uh, the ability to target uh, impact uh, within the funds. So you're able to focus on a particular uh, theme uh, that you may have or uh, uh, an initiative that you feel is appropriate. A theme an example would be something like maybe economic inclusion. Uh, an initiative might be something like uh, a minority cares uh, focus. Uh, so you're able to direct your funds to support those types of uh, 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 impact of, uh, objectives. Uh, they do a very good job of following through on reporting, which is really important. And we haven't really talked about this, but you know, in, in any impact investment, we want to. Um, understand that uh, we're receiving the results we expect. So they, they share information on a regular basis and they also have a, a pretty good um, uh, website to, to provide information on, on the industry and what's going on in terms of reporting trends and uh, impact initiatives uh, across the board, which is helpful. Yes, that's CCM Invests, and that's um, ccminvest.com is their website, Community Capital Management. Tell us a little more, Tom. I mean, you, you've decided to allocate some money to them. You talk about the impact. Give us, are there other ones like that? How did, they, how did you distinguish them amongst others that, I mean, obviously, this flexibility you just mentioned in terms of the type of impact you're able to achieve with them, um, diversity in their leadership, other things like that that appealed to you? Yeah, so so they... Um... They are one of many, as you as you point out, Felipe. There are other firms out there. Uh, Schroeder's is a good example. TIA Cref is another one. Uh, there are many of new products coming on the market all the time that are ETFs, um, as well as funds focusing on uh, impact investing. Um, I think what we liked about them is is we you know we felt comfortable with their process. Uh, you know we liked that they do focus primarily 
uh, in um, the mortgage related markets. And for the reasons I mentioned earlier, uh, lots of an emphasis on corporates uh, for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Uh, they have a very diverse team, uh, experienced team uh, that's worked together. Uh, and this has been part of their, uh, we'll call it the core of their business for a while. It's not a new, new product or new trend that they've come up with. That's super helpful. And Tom, maybe just before we leave here, um, some of the audience might be listening and might be more from a philanthropic context and less involved on their investment side in the past. And they might be just interested in, you know, as they talk to their investment managers and try to do more mission-driven work, um, how should they think about fixed income? I know generally we think about equities as a big part of our portfolio. Then we think about fixed income as lower return, but more uh, principal conservation. Help as an investment advisor, just give us some context of where this usually fits in a portfolio and how this can be thought of as we transition portfolios to be 100% towards impact or all mission embodied. Sure. So I think I think in the case of fixed income, you know that the interesting question people are asking about from an asset allocation perspective is is do the traditional rules for fixed income apply today? If we go into an environment where interest rates start to move higher, uh, how will that affect uh, the correlation benefits of fixed income versus equities? Um, that's a, a question that's out there. Uh, I, I'm a believer that you should always have a diversified allocation. I, I do think over a market cycle, fixed income will provide the benefits you expect. Uh, in terms of impact investing, uh, there is today more opportunities on the private side and in the public side that may change going forward. Uh, but I think really um, that's where you see more opportunities. If you do go into private based fixed income investing, you're probably going to uh, be able to have more of a direct impact. Uh, you're going to be able to negotiate uh, with uh, a borrower uh, to uh, provide the, the source of funding they need, but also to make sure that the impact is consistent with your objectives. Uh, those deals tend to, because you're giving up liquidity, tend to have a little bit more return or higher yield, uh, which is uh, helpful, particularly today, given the, where interest rates are. Tom, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Um, My pleasure. Any final words, any final questions that you encourage the broader Catholic ecology or faith-based investors that, to ask um, as they think about these questions or any other tidbits of advice? Well, I would, I would only say that I think it, it's really exciting time to be investing. And uh, I really think that there's going to be many of uh, many interesting opportunities for uh, all of us to consider. Uh, and it's a great way for us to you know, further integrate uh, you know, our faith into our uh, investment process, which I think is really important. Uh, it benefits all. So that's, uh, I think, something we should be thinking about. Thank you so much, Tom.